So my co-editor and I, Kelly Greenhill, professor up the road at Tufts University, both looked at each other and said, we need to assign a book on coercion in the 21st century. We know there's lots of great studies of coercion regarding nuclear weapons, regarding conventional weapons, written by people like Thomas Schelling, who won the Nobel Prize for writing about things like coercion, but we don't know how we can explain coercion regarding forced migration, or coercion regarding smart sanctions, or cyber coercion, or coercion regarding counterterrorism. Now, for those who don't know, coercion is using or threatening violence to get an actor to change its behavior or to do something it otherwise would not do. And again, we've got great studies of how we can use nuclear weapons to do this, and to some extent how you can use conventional militaries to do this, but how can you use refugees to do this? How can you use sanctions to do this? How can you coerce one's adversaries, allies, to get them to change their behavior? So we wanted the book that would explain all of that. And so what we decided to do is to write this book, Coercion, The Power to Hurt in International Politics, along with a number of different contributors, both at Boston College, like Professor Tim Crawford, and professors from around the country, everyone contributing chapters on different angles for coercion. Now, the contributions that we see are that we're first looking at new tools. So we're looking at things like drones, right, which weren't around 10, 20 years ago, and drone strikes, how they can coerce insurgents or terrorists to change their behavior. Or looking at things like smart sanctions. So we know about economic sanctions, but smart sanctions the idea that you're going to target certain people inside a regime, say inside of Russia or inside of North Korea, to get them to change their behavior, hopefully without hurting, in the broader sense, the general population. Or we look at tools like cyber, right? The idea that you can actually try to shut down or deny service to someone on the internet or to take down certain aspects of their government electronic grid. Those types of things can make a difference, and you can threaten those to get a government to change its behavior. So we're looking at new types of tools. We're also looking at new mechanisms. Conventionally, coercion is about kind of a two-sided game. One side's coercing the other state to get it to change its behavior. As Tim and others look at, sometimes it can be like a trilateral model, where you are trying to coerce your adversary's allies to get them out of the game so you can then get that adversary to change its behavior. Or, as Karen Freeman writes about, you can try to coerce a base state that's hosting a terrorist group to get it to kind of kick out the terrorist organization or crack down on it. So, different mechanisms. And then finally, <coughs> We kind of, you know, look at different kind of dynamics within that and different outcomes. So we are looking at, um, you know, the stability-instability paradox inside of cyber coercion. We are looking at U.S. foreign policy regarding coercion and regime change. We are looking at when, because of, you know, climate change, we have the exposure of all these natural resources in the Arctic, how are states going to kind of coercively compete over that stuff regarding their economic policy, regarding mining natural resources, etc. So we see kind of our contribution as writing a volume about coercion coercion for the 21st century, explaining these new tools, explaining these new mechanisms, and doing something that both allows us to kind of push forward our research programs, but also provide a new foundation for our students to be able to learn more about this type of coercion. I would add, I think, that um, another strength of the volume is that it spreads out the analyses across domains of international politics that haven't traditionally been subjected to coercive, let's say, the coercive analytical approach. For example, uh, one of the authors looks at how um, base states or host states of um, non-state violent actors, terrorist groups, can be pressured to put pressure on those actors, and so that, that's the indirect coercion uh, approach. Another one of our contributors, who is also the editor, Kelly Greenhill, has looked at how refugee flows or population movements can be manipulated to pressure other countries. And so these are domains of, of coercion that haven't typically been brought sort of under the microscope of, of coercive theory. And so that's one of the things that makes the, the volume really sort of original and, uh, and makes a big contribution. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. I would just simply add, going off Tin's point for Kelly's chapter, um, we can just look at so many current events today beyond the North Korea example that I mentioned. Uh, in Kelly's chapter, she's applying her theory of forced migration, coercive kind of forced migration, to Gaddafi in Libya. And what's fascinating about that is that we all know Gaddafi, you know, was kind of overthrown from power, and we think, oh, maybe that's because of the Arab Spring or these broader uprisings, and certainly that's part of it. But another part of the story is that for many years, Gaddafi was kind of coercing European states to basically bribe him and pay him off. Otherwise, in his words, he would, quote, 
quote, turn Europe black, basically allow all of these refugees or economic migrants to go from Libya's shores over the Mediterranean Sea into Italy, into France. And so he was coercively getting the Europeans to pay him all this money. And one of the reasons that they eventually decided to go after him and probably get rid of him was because they were tired of doing so. And so he basically pushed that button one too many times. It's one of the reasons he was forced out of power. So building off of Tim's point, we're both applying this to new domains. And then when we look around today at all these various you know, current events and you know, US foreign policy episodes, we think we probably have a chapter that applies to that, including things like cyber coercion, which again is something that you hear about a lot in the news. Could there be a cyber Pearl Harbor? Are there cyber attacks that influence government policy? We have a great chapter from John Lindsay and Eric Gartsky that deals with that issue. So what is the theory of coercive isolation and why does it matter? The, the theory of co coercive isolation starts with a basic intuition, which is that um, in international politics, coercive attempts are rarely one-on-one -on -one interactions. Instead, they're group affairs. And the group that is of particular interest for the theory of coercive isolation are those allies and potential supporters that surround the target um, that can influence its willingness or its uh, tendency to comply or defy uh, coercive threats. And the basic idea is that states, targeted states, that uh, have high expectations of support or who do have committed supporters um, who are sort of running interference for them are just much less likely to comply. So that's the, that's the basic intuition. And so what the theory uh, does is it focuses on two things. The first is how the target's um, expectations of support um, shape the prospects of getting it to comply, right? And this is important in some, some sort of subtle ways. For example, if the target is um, convinced that it must have the support of, let's say, ally A uh, in order to be able to uh, defy or withstand the coercive pressure, well then, if you're the coercer, if you can deprive ally A, or if you can move ally A out of the supporting camp, then you've basically won the political game, right? So that's great. But if it's a situation where you're going into a crisis and your target, the target of coercion, has already discounted the importance of ally A's support, well, then you can invest a lot of effort in trying to separate ally A, isolating, and it won't have as much of a punch because the party has are, the, the target has already sort of discounted the importance of that. So that takes us back then to this point uh, that uh, it's really important for the coercer to try to understand what are the expectations of support of the of the target. Uh, so, which is another way of saying you can't just sort of like read the map externally and say, oh, it's got these three allies; those are the targets for my isolation policy. Uh, you've got to really sort of figure out who are the ones that sort of have leverage or pull. Um, so that's the first thing that it focuses on. And then the second thing that the, that the theory focuses on is how the coercer can manipulate incentives then to dislodge those supporters, right? And so it's, it's really about um, um, using instruments of statecraft to shape the sort of surrounding coalition in a way that isolates the target and thus makes it more vulnerable to threats of force. Why does it matter? Um, it matters because in the study of coercive uh, diplomacy and coercion uh, sort of over the history of the literature, that one-on-one -on -one model that I mentioned at the beginning really has sort of dominated uh, the way people uh, at least theorize coercion. Coercion. And so uh, my theory is an attempt to sort of bring this wider game of co coercive dom diplomacy under our purview and to sort of uh, to, to take account of it in a systematic way so that we can better describe and explain uh, how coercion works and what are the conditions under which coercive attempts are more or less likely to succeed or fail.
So last year I wrote a book called Rebel Power, uh, Why National Movements Compete, Fight, and Win. And in that book I look and try to explain why some nations get states and others don't. So in this case I looked at why were the Zionists able to achieve the state of Israel? Why were the Algerians able to achieve the state of Algeria? Why were the Irish able to get the state of Ireland but not Northern Ireland as part of it? And why were the Palestinians unable, at least to this point, of getting a real state of Palestine? And so in that sense I'm trying to look at the internal politics of national movements and explain how the very various factions that share this common goal of statehood nonetheless squabble and compete with one another to line themselves up to lead the new state or to lead the movement while they're struggling together against this common regime. Now, what I did in my, for my chapter in this book, Coercion, the Power to Hurt in International Politics, is I took kind of a critique I faced from my previous book, where many people said, you know, book's really interesting, did a lot of great research, I know your argument is attractive, but there's this other factor that you're not considering extensively, which is colonialism. And maybe the reason a lot of these states became independent is because the British, the French empires, etc., all were pulling back from the world. And so it wasn't so much the actions and agency of the national movements themselves, it was these empires who are pulling back and kind of giving them states. And so I said, okay, you know, I don't fully agree with that critique, but let me do a test on the first post-colonial success of a national movement in Africa. In part because also my previous book focused so much on the Middle East. So in this case, that's why I looked at Eritrea. Eritrea was this territory that, you know, the Italians had previously kind of colonized, the British had been in there, but it wasn't a case where they got independence from the British or from the Italians. Instead, they got independence from Ethiopia. Ethiopia, in the mid-20th century kind of annexed Eritrea and it became part of that country for many decades. And yet what was puzzling and fascinating is that in the 60s and 70s you had these same groups, the EPLF, the ELF, these various kind of militant groups who were fighting for Eritrean independence and they weren't able to achieve it. And yet they're able to achieve it in the late 80s and early 90s and kind of why is that? It didn't have to do with colonialism because Ethiopia is right there, it's not one of these European powers who's colonizing the area. In fact, both the United States and the Soviet Union both backed the Ethiopian government, which is fascinating. There's very few cases in the Cold War where you have both superpowers backing a certain state. They both did so, and yet the Eritreans were able to get their own independence. Now, the reason for that that I argue is that it's about the internal balance of power inside the movement. So in the 60s and the 70s, you had these multiple factions who were roughly equivalent in power to one another. And so they would talk about things like, we're going to do this common operation against the Ethiopian government to try try to gain territory and gain our independence, and yet along the way they'd start shooting at each other, or one or the other would kind of withdraw to let the other party take the brunt of the offensive from the Ethiopian government. And so in this way, that lack of trust, that degree of infighting, really prevented the movement from being effective. What happened by the late 1980s is that one of the groups basically physically eliminated the other, to the point that it became what I call the hegemon, this dominant faction that's able to impose a cohesive strategy when it's time for diplomacy to get broad broader African countries or broader European countries to support Eritrean independence. They speak with one voice instead of many voices. And when it comes time to fight the Ethiopian army on the battlefield, despite being outnumbered, they soundly defeat them because now they can coordinate their forces in a way they couldn't when you had multiple autonomous factions. And so that's the basic argument I have in my chapter. It explains again not only why nations are able to get states in some cases but not others. Think more recently the Kurds in Iraq or uh, the Catalans in Spain or the South Sudanese, some getting states, some yet not, not yet getting states. But it also explains kind of the history of the Eritrean national movement, which is one, to be honest, most of our listeners probably have not heard of before or know much about, but I think it's a fascinating one that really demonstrates these kind of internal dynamics of coercion, where in this case you're trying to coerce a state to kind of give you independence for some autonomous region within the country. So how does my theory of coercive isolation fit into my, uh, my, my larger research? Well, for a number of years now, I've been working on a book that examines what I call wedge strategies, which are basically strategies that states use to divide adversaries or break up opposing coalitions. The book title uh, is still tentative, but uh, it's The Power to Divide. Um, Good title. Yeah, which was partly inspired by <laughs> this one. So... Um, and the theoretical focus of the book is, has really been uh, uh, on the how question. How is it that states are able to divide their adversaries? Um, and 
along those lines, I put a lot of emphasis on the use of incentives or concessions on the part of the divider. So basically what the divider does is it approaches a set of adversaries and it picks one and it treats it better than it treats the others. It offers it some carrots while it's confronting the others with a more confrontational, aggressive stance. But the idea is essentially to sort of mix up the incentives so that the, the party that you're trying to peel off has good reasons uh, and, and can see advantages uh, for, for basically pulling away, either going neutral or even in a most ambitious kind of approach, flipping around and coming over to my side in a conflict. Um, so that's sort of been the focus of the book. This chapter allowed me to go deeper into the question of why do states use these strategies? To what ends? And in the book, I talk about um, to what kind of foreign policy ends. And in the book, I talk about a, a wide range of them, um, which sort of start from sort of like at the grand strategic level. I'm trying to deter an adversary from going to war, or maybe I'm trying to slow it down. And so the calculation is if I can take away one of its allies, it'll, uh, it'll mess up its timetable for going to war. And that might sort of misfoot it and then give me a chance to be able to prepare to fight at a, at a later time when I'm ready. So there's all sorts of kinds of calculations. But one of the ways that states can use the, these dividing strategies then is as a coercive tool. Within the concept of coercion, we have uh, deterrence, which is to, 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 to prevent an actor from doing something that it might otherwise do. Uh, and then compellence, which is to make an actor do something, right? And the making of them, making them do something can be either to force them to stop doing something or to force them to start doing something, okay? And so in my chapter, I'm looking at the compellence side. So how can wedge strategies be used to either force a target to stop doing something that it's doing or to start doing something that I want it to do. Um, and so uh, in, it, it, that's essentially what the chapter allowed me to do. And then I was able to break it down and apply it to a sequence of four or five different case studies, diplomatic history case studies, ranging from the late 19th century and, and, and to the early and mid 20th century, all the way up actually to the end of the Cold War. In terms of my research program, as I previously explained, um, this chapter for me is in many ways a bridge between my previous book, Rebel Power, Why National Movements Compete, Fight, and Win, and my next book, working title, To Which Victor Go the Spoils, Explaining Which Factions Take Power After Regime Change. So the first thing I was doing for my chapter in this book is to say, okay, I'm trying to explain why some nations get states and others don't, in this case trying to look at a post-colonial case outside of the Middle East, in this case an African case in Eritrea. But the next thing I'm trying to do for my research program is to explain when you do have an insurgency or a rebellion or a revolution and the government is overthrown. We have a decent amount of literature now on the likelihood of that regime enduring or the likelihood of the revolution succeeding and actually changing the government. What we do less of a good job at, whether we're scholars or policymakers of the general public, is explaining which of those various factions who is part of the uprising is actually going to come to power and lead the new government. And we can look at a lot of historical examples of this. Uh, Bob Jervis, who is one of, I think, Tim's mentors uh, at Columbia, um, tried to explain, looking at the Iranian Revolution, why U.S. intelligence said, okay, you know, we think the Shah might endure, okay, he might fall, but then they said things like, you know, Khomeini's going to be kind of a bit player. He's not going to be able to consolidate power after the Shah falls. And if you look at the New York Times, the Washington Post, they said the same thing. And yet, obviously, as we know, Khomeini not only came to power, his government in many ways has stayed in power to this day many decades later. Um, similarly, looking at Libya, after Gaddafi was overthrown, which again was part of Kelly Greenhill's chapter in the book. Um, there was this feeling that, uh, you know, Jabril or one of these other leaders would be able to kind of consolidate and unite all the factions in Libya that were fighting against Gaddafi. Instead, at various points, we had three different governments inside of Libya, all claiming sovereignty and control of the state. So again, we did not do a great job, either as outside scholars or as policymakers, trying to predict and understand who's actually going to come to power after regime change. And that's incredibly important because if you look at, say, Syria today, the reason that countries are either intervening or not intervening 
is because they're predicting what will be the likely outcome if Assad falls. From the case of the Iranians or the Russians or Hezbollah, they all think the alternative to Assad is much worse. So that's why they're in there to keep him in power. From the perspective of the Saudis or at various points the Turks or the Qataris, they're in there because they think the alternative to Assad will be better. One of the reasons that the United States, either under President Obama or under President Trump, has been kind of very soft peddling any type of intervention, if any intervention at all in Syria, is because there's no love for Assad by either President Obama or President Trump. But also there's a lot of concern about what would come next. Would it be ISIS or some jihadi link group? Uh, would it potentially be not a good alternative to Assad? And so explaining which faction is likely to come to power after regime change, I think is incredibly important, not just from a scholarly perspective, but also from a policymaker perspective. So what I've been doing for the past couple of years with my research team here at BC is we've been building a data set of hundreds of different insurgencies and rebellions, looking at all the various factions that are inside them, looking at their ideology, their use of violence or nonviolence, looking at um, whether they're allying with other groups, looking at their relative strength, and then seeing one, five, and 10 years after regime change, which of these groups are actually in the government, which ones are leading the government. And it'll give us kind of this broad overview of what are kind of the common factors that allow groups to kind of rise to power and capture the spoils of victory. So this book fits nicely within that. And the final thing I'll add, and I think this is true for both Tim and myself, you know, we also think of our research programs in the context of our teaching. And one of the motivations, again, for this book at the outset, both for Kelly and myself, and I think for Tim and the other contributors is we want to have a book that we can assign to our students, both graduate students and undergraduates, concerning coercion kind of in the modern era. And we have excellent books uh, from Thomas Schelling or, you know, many others, Barry Posen, you know, John Mearsheimer, on coercion kind of from a conventional or nuclear sense. But now we have a book that we can assign to say, oh, you're interested in cyber coercion, you're interested in drone strikes, you're interested in economic smart sanctions, you're interested in all these kind of new types of coercion, we have a book for you. And so I look forward to kind of assigning this and using this, and that in a broad sense is also part, I think, of our research programs. So what are the policy implications of uh, the, the theory of coercive isolation? Well, I would highlight three. Um, the, the first one is <clears throat> that, uh, the way I put it, is that uh, the targets, the target of coercion, the target's allies are targets too. Uh, or to put it differently, when you're engaging in coercive diplomacy or coercion against a target that does have supporters, you can never do just one thing. You can't just focus on the target. Your strategy uh, has to deal with the incentives of the other players. And that requires a, a nuanced approach. I mean, this is sort of the essence of what statecraft is about. It's, it's working working the angles um, in a way that um, will allow you to get your objectives despite the fact that there are multiple parties who are operating in ways that may very well be trying to frustrate your objectives. So you can never do just one thing with a coercive strategy. It's got to take into consideration the incentives and the interests of the other actors that are surrounding the target. and. Uh, one of the things that I argue is most important for a coercive isolator, if you will, uh, is to keep in mind the importance of incentives or positive incentives or inducements, concessions. Because if you try to go at a target that has supporters and you go hard at all of them, if you come aggressively towards all of them, usually what happens is you uh, create a counterproductive response, right? They, they band together more tightly. This is sort of a, an expression of the basic logic of balancing in international politics. Countries band together against a common threat. Well, if you go up against a target and its allies aggressively on all fronts, basically what you're doing is you're making yourself a common threat, right? And so uh, it's important then when you're trying to coerce one of these parties, the target, that you have some sort of nuance in the policy with respect to the others so that you can create some gaps. So the, that's the first policy implication is that you can never do just one thing and, and, and usually if you are going to coerce a target you need to be using carrots to influence other actors uh, in, the, in, in, the, in sort of the domain. Uh, so then that leads then to the second policy implication which is that <clears throat> 
successful coercive isolation is not cheap, right? So in, in the study of coerce, coercion and coercive diplomacy, we have this sort of idea that coercive success is relatively cheap. And it is cheap relative to having to actually use brute force, right? The ultimate use of force is to get someone to do what you want without actually having to apply it, right? They sort of, they can sort of like see the handwriting on the wall. They understand that their situation is gonna be much worse if you bring down the hammer. And so they comply, right? And so uh, there's this idea then that, that successful coercion is, is cheap. And uh, um, the point that I try to make in my chapter is that, well, if you widen the lens and you look at all of the concessions or the inducements and all of the sort of diplomatic heavy lifting that goes into creating a context in which coercive threats can be successful, you can see that there's a lot of costs involved with that. And so successful coercive diplomacy, coercive isolation diplomacy, precisely because it requires paying a price for others, to others, to get them to sort of separate or isolate the target. Uh, makes it costly. Uh, and then the third uh, application or the third policy uh, relevant piece here that I would emphasize is this idea uh, that in order to isolate an adversary on the other side of the con on the other side, one often needs to sort of do a really good job of alliance management on your own side, right? Um, if you, have, if, if you and your allies are operating at cross purposes in a, in a coercive interaction, if you're sending signals towards one party that you're trying to peel off that are, um, that are accommodative, uh, but your ally is basically undercutting the signal by threatening that party, right? So then you've got mixed messages and that can sort of screw up the whole thing. And so basically, in a nutshell, the idea is in order to take advantages of gaps or to expose gaps and exploit gaps in your adversary's camp, you've really got to do a good job of sort of circling the wagons in your own camp and coordinating and collaborating well with your allies. And um, that's a part of coercive diplomacy that also often gets neglected in the one-on-one -on -one interaction, right? And so, which takes me back to the point that I made at the very beginning, which is, these things are group affairs, and so part of what I'm trying to do with my, with my theoretical approach is to bring these groups back into the, the, our understanding of how these groups operate back into sort of the theoretical matrix. I'll just add a couple more. Um, so one, just kind of from my own work, is that, you know, there's kind of a catch-22 regarding national movements and insurgencies and supporting them and what the aftermath is, and it's simply this. Um, if you want a successful insurgency or national movement, then you want it to be what I call is hegemonic, which basically means there's one dominant faction within it. The challenge with that, and we see that in my chapter for Eritrea, is that if you have a national movement or an insurgency that's hegemonic, what that means is the second that it achieves victory, it's basically a one-party state because there's only one significant faction that can kind of run the show, and since these are selfish actors, it's likely to set up a constitution, election system, if they have elections at all, that are all going to favor that one party. And so the United States government, at least you know, rhetorically, often wants democracy in other countries. Well, if that's the case, then you kind of want a pluralistic uh, you know, movement or insurgency where there's multiple significant factions. The problem there is that that gets you the competition in elections or for power after regime change, but it makes it less likely you get regime change in the first place. And so from the US government perspective, when it's trying to couple at various times regime change plus democratization, as we've seen attempted in Iraq, as we've seen attempted in Afghanistan, as we've seen attempted in Libya, it's often been a disaster. And then one of the key reasons for that is not just these are tough neighborhoods and there's lots of local actors the U.S. government doesn't understand. It's also the fact that what gets you victory often does not get you democracy thereafter. So that's one key implication. A couple of others I'll add briefly regarding the broader volume. We often think about coercion in terms of violence because it's the use or threat of violence to get something you want. So we think, oh, you want to be better at coercion? Invest more in the military, right? Get bigger bombs, bigger planes, better nuclear weapons, etc. One of the key takeaways from our book is that, no, you should be investing a lot in intelligence. Because to be successful at coercion, you need to know a lot of things about your adversary. You need to know how strong the adversary is, what its intentions are, what kind of its red lines really are versus what's bluster and bluffing. You need to know who its allies 
allies are, how committed they are to the various state. All of these are really, really important things to know that are worth far more than having a few more tanks or a few more planes or whatever else. And yet when we think about coercion, it's often about investing in kind of these tools of war instead of understanding better the adversary and its behavior. You do that better, you're gonna have more effective coercion. Other things we would add regarding things like cyber coercion that are not well that not, not, not that well understood. Um, people in the media talk a lot about, oh, will there be a cyber 9-11 or a cyber Pearl Harbor where all of a sudden the FAA gets taken over and planes go down everywhere or whatever else. Our uh, authors in the chapter, John Lindsay and Eric Gartsky, basically argue, you know, that's pretty unlikely. Not because it's not possible, but because it's kind of like a mad world. And what I mean by that is mutually assured destruction. Because other countries are also plugged into the web and the internet and whatnot, they are equally vulnerable. And so what they say is going to result is what we call a stability-instability paradox, whereby at the level of kind of massive cyber attacks or massive types of um, coercive engagements with cyber, that's going to be unlikely because if you do it, it's going to be easily attributed to you and the other state's gonna be able to retaliate. So what we're gonna see instead is kind of this lower level instability where you have kind of smaller level attempts at coercion you know, economic ones or otherwise, in part because countries know it's not gonna to escalate to this high level destru destroying other societies because that would lead to kind of mutual destruction of the two sides. The final thing we'd all argue from policy implications is simply that the stronger actor is not always going to win these coercive encounters. In fact, as we see from US foreign policy or from other states, many of our chapters are about how the weaker state wins. Why does the weaker state win? Maybe it cares more about the stakes that are being fought over. Maybe it has certain advantages in terms of how it's kind of cohesively aligned. Maybe it has advantages in terms of geography. Maybe it has advantages in terms of the stakes that are laid out. Maybe it has advantages in terms of the US or the stronger state doesn't just want to change behavior, they want to eliminate the adversary. There's all these reasons for why the US or other strong states shouldn't go into these course of encounters and say, well, we're stronger, we're likely to emerge victorious. Instead, you really need to think through What's your strategy? What's the objective you're trying to achieve? How much does the other side care about it? And again, circling back to, you know a lot of those things by having strong intelligence, and that's something we think the U.S. should invest in heavily. Uh, on, the, on the topic of uh, the policy relevance of the theory of coercive isolation, I think a useful uh, uh, contemporary case or example is the politics of the run-up to this Iran nuclear deal that is at this moment sort of hanging in the balance the question of whether or not the Trump administration is going to renew its support or continued U.S. support for the deal. Well, in the years leading up to that deal, um, the Obama administration and then, in fact, before that, the Bush administration. Um, were engaged in an attempt to coerce Iran into negotiations that would lead to such a deal, right? And so there was this uh, pretty prolonged diplomatic, coercive, economic effort to sort of get Iran to the point where it would be willing to negotiate. And some of those dimensions that I talked about uh, uh, earlier in describing the theory were sort of brought to life in that case. Uh, um, in particular, for the, the United States and its allies, who had to go through quite a bit of work to get coordinated on how they wanted to deal with Iran, um, one of the issues for them as they were putting pressure on Iran was the fact that Russia was one of Iran's supporters. And as they were getting Russian support for, let's say, the multilateral approach to coercing Iran into coming to an agreement about its nuclear program was that there were other things happening with Russia, in particular in Eastern Europe, that were playing out at exactly the same time. And so one of the costs that the United States and its allies had to pay in order to get Russian support for the Iran deal was to moderate their reaction to Russian behavior in Ukraine and before that in Georgia. So there are these, there are these linkages in, in policies, in policy domains that get back to this idea that you have to sometimes pay a price with respect to certain actors, with respect to certain issues, in order to get a better or more conducive environment for using coercion in another domain. The volume offers 
uh, many opportunities to integrate uh, the content into undergraduate and graduate teaching. So for my own purposes, I can see using this volume in at least three different classes that I teach. Um, I teach an undergraduate course on the causes of war. I teach an undergraduate course on intelligence at international security. And then I teach a graduate seminar in security studies. And in each of these courses, there are um, topics that uh, correspond to uh, ma the material that's covered in the volume. For example, in my Causes of War class, uh, we cover um, the use of force for humanitarian purposes or humanitarian intervention. We cover the use of force in civil war contexts. Um, we cover the problem of proliferation. And um, we look at how uh, deterrence and coercive diplomacy can operate. And so there's like these four different segments there. And when I go back and I look at the table of contents of this volume, I can see that on um, you know, the problem of using force for humanitarian operations, there's a chapter by Phil Hahn that looks at, at, at these kinds of things. When I, when I turn to the use of force in civil war context, there's chapters by Karen Freeman and by, 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 by um, Peter Krauss. Um, and so the list kind of goes on there. Uh, with, with, coer with coercion and proliferation, there's a nice chapter by Tristan Volpe on the way that on how countries that have the potential to proliferate or to develop nuclear weapons can get leverage out of that potential, um, which I think is a, you know fits really nicely into sort of uh, a teaching about why states pursue nuclear programs. In my graduate seminar in security studies, we have two two big sections devoted to coercion, coercive diplomacy, and deterrence. And, uh, you know, the, the, the lead-off chapter in this volume by, by, by Bob Art and, and Kelly Greenhill is, you know, definitely going to be one of these chapters that's going to be, that's going to fit perfectly in my syllabus, and I think that's going to be widely used, because it provides you sort of like a one, a, a one-stop uh, sh you know, shopping opportunity to sort of like get an overview of the development of theoretical work in uh, coercion uh, um, over, you know, the last 50 years. So it's a really, it's a great sort of um, synthesis, um, analytical synthesis of work in the field on coercion. Um, and then I also teach this class on intelligence. And there, Austin Long's chapter on intelligence as an enabler of coercion is um, uh, is going to be very useful as well.